but after that the entire neighborhoods of bangalore all the new neighborhoods did not have a drainage pattern and plan and what they did was these network of tanks that existed we call them rajakaluves which connects one tank to the other those rajakaluves were converted into sewers and all the sewage were led into them Um, I just had a, you know, a, a kind of a suggestion, in the sense that uh, I know we're talking about the corruption aspect, and you know, there's no uh, suggestion for that except to remove it. But uh, in Manali, in Chennai, you know, uh, for the ter tertiary plant, I mean, like uh, we were discussing, um, the primary is just to remove mechanically, and the secondary is basically, you know, the trickling. Uh, water and it's also you know for increasing the aeration basically there are different ways to do it but uh, what is now being done is activated sludge and things like that and the tertiary is supposed to remove the chemicals and the TDS and everything um, they have made in Manali industrial estate I don't know whether it's successful I don't know whether it exists till now but I know that it started off with the uh, with the industries paying for the tertiary so, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no corruption in that sector, but all I'm saying is, is that one way of looking at it, you know, because uh, the Vedras refineries and everything was there, and they said that if you want water, this is the only water we have, but then you have to pay for it, and you pay for the tertiary, and you take the water. So, I don't know whether that's something to look at. Uh, of course, you will still, even if you have ROs, biggest problem we're having in Tirupur and all those places is, what do you do with the sludge? Because even in an RO, you are you you know you're just transferring the heavy metals from the liquid phase to the solid phase, yeah. but you know that really doesn't solve the actual question. I am dead against tertiary treatment plants. Mm -hmm. You know the reason is it's so expensive to construct and also maintain. It is an energy guzzler. Uh, they the I think Suez Lyonnais of France came and set up a tertiary treatment plant inside Kaban Park, ah. which itself was controversial, and uh, the water that they produce is so expensive that even uh, UBCT doesn't, I mean, I think UBCT is more recently negotiating a lower rate. UBCT is this huge uh, complex that uh, Vijay Maldi has built on what was, his, uh, you know, a site for his brewery earlier. Uh, so it's so expensive, the water, that uh, who will afford it? I mean, that's not the idea of how you should consume water. Industries cannot afford it. So I, I think the route to go is not to at all invest in tertiary treatment plant. We are in a subtropical area. Uh, the river flows and cleans itself up. River has a self-purification property. We need to augment that. Stream flows can also uh, be, you know, augmented for its self uh, So what we are proposing, in fact, there's a report I can uh, show you, is that we are proposing that the Raja Kalwe, so the canals which interconnect tanks within the densely populated uh, built areas, and the stream flows between urban centers are somehow transformed into constructed wetlands. Uh, what it really means is, I, I don't see hyacinth as a, as an, uh, as a, as a nuisance, uh, if it is used in a very intelligent way. It has a very high phytoremediation uh, quality. It removes heavy metals from the waters. If you try to remove the same thing through a chemical process or through uh, you know, uh, iron mechanical uh, processes that tertiary treatment plants use, you have to invest repeatedly in energy, I mean continuously actually in energy, which makes the water unaffordable, right? Uh, so this is one part of the problem which I think we can easily resolve by going in for constructed wetlands. Uh, it has been proven in Thailand, uh, Taiwan, uh, it has been proven in many parts of uh, tropical, the tropical belt. It may not work very well in temperate zones, but for tropical and subtropical zones, uh, it's a waste to actually, uh, again, you know, it's, it's the industry which is pushing ter tertiary tr treatment plants. <coughs> so, um, here, uh, in during the discussion, had mentioned so most of the tank being filled up for the construction. But the here question is that tank is the common property resources or personal property? Because if common property resources one cannot fill up and make the construction, and if personal, then one even personal property resource, personal property remain the people cannot fill up the tank, because even, even you see the Delhi, 262 tanks being filled, but it's re, re innovated by the last 
uh, decades. So how this process is going on? Filling on. Yeah. Uh, good question because what you see is the lake systems in Bangalore. Uh, uh, each of these <coughs> dots is a lake which is interconnected with the Rajakalways or the canals. Uh, but I want, the way I would like to respond to your uh, comment is to show you a, a very successful effort that we did. Uh, about late 80s, uh, Bangalore really saw a res you know, very high interest in protecting its lake systems. Uh, so the chief minister in the mid 80s was Ram Krishnaigde. And uh, he constituted a committee under uh, Mr. Lakshman Rao, who was the administrator of Bangalore in the uh, decades before, and uh, well regarded by everybody. And Mr. Lakshman Rao went and visited almost every tank which was in the then built area of Bangalore, which was about 260, 300 kilomet square kilometers. And he enumerated about 115 tanks existed, and about 15 or 20 of them had disappeared. Uh, some of them by, mo in fact, most of them by, uh, you know, swallowed by the government. <laughs> for many of its own institutions. Uh, all of these are not private tanks. All of these are common property resources. Okay? In fact, all, all over South, Asia, South, Asia, South India, these are all common property resources. Uh, so the Lakshman Rao Committee report came out in 88, and it was, uh, an order was passed by the chief minister to protect each and every one of these tanks, and the forest department was made the custodian. The forest department did a good job but in the 90s, and what it really involved was they had to go and find out who had encroached and litigate. The litigation sometimes took four, five, six years. By the time that job was maturing and you could have recovered the lakes, Mr. S. M. Krishna had become the chief minister in 1999. You know what he did? He set up the Lake Development Authority in 2002. And that Lake Development Authority was set up as a society. Now, what's, what's interesting is a decade, a few years before, the World Bank had given a huge loan. I am not sure what was the volume of the loan. Uh, it was ran into hundreds of crores to rehabilitate lakes of tanks, as we call them, irrigation tanks of Karnataka. This was the decade of intense uh, political struggle on the Kaveri River water between, uh, at that time, Jairalita was the chief minister, I think, uh, towards the end. She raised an objection. She said, if you are going to rehabilitate lakes in the Kaveri basin of Karnataka, that means the water flow into Kaveri will come down. That water belongs to Tamil Nadu. So we will object to World Bank supporting the rehabilitation of tanks within the Kaveri Basin. So if you see the, uh, what is called Jalat Samvardhana Yojani, as it was later called, the rehabilitation of tanks is taking place outside of the Kaveri Basin. So <laughs> what would have actually helped the system worked against it because of the politics. But anyway. In the city of Bangalore, which is the worst affected by the degeneration of lakes, Mr. Krishna's effort of setting up the LDA, though well-meaning, was done in a way that it ended up privatizing the lakes. Oberoi got one lake, a couple of builders got another lake. We found, for instance, in 2005 and investigated, one builder uh, got a huge lake which has a spread of some <laughs> 100 acres, uh, which is a very critical watershed uh, for the eastern part of Bangalore because it really was unpolluted at that time. And it had just been rehabilitated with a Norwegian grant and was a pretty lake full of birds teeming with uh, waterfowl. If you went now, for instance, migratory waterfowl would be teeming there. So, and this lake had been given to a company called Biota. When we tried to find out the company, the company did not exist. So the question was what was going on? So we started working on this. And we realized the whole policy of privatization of lakes would lead to privatization of water. So we went on a PIL after a series of campaigns and so on, which, I mean, they were not going to listen to our, you know, protests on the streets. We did street protests. We did lake pro uh, protests around lake, each and every lake. So we went into court in 2008. Our challenge was twofold. One is that the existing policies, for instance, the Lakshman Rao report, which is binding on the government, is being neglected. And in uh, 2007, a very interesting uh, development took place in Karnataka. For the first time, in fact, first time in any legislature of the state, uh, of any state in uh, India, a joint legislative committee was set up to identify the extent to which public lands or common lands had been encroached. And in this case, Bangalore was the region chosen. And this legislative committee, drawing from all political parties, about 15, 16 MLAs were part of it, 
identified 50,000 acres within Bangalore had been encroached and they named all of them. There were judges, there were senior administrators, there were major uh, industrialists and you know, captains of IT sector were also encroachers. They named all of them and they produced the report. Somehow or the other they managed to usher up the report. But the MLA who chaired the committee, he came out and he said, I don't care about my future, I'm going to put it into the public domain. Somebody went to court, the judges tried to usher it up. Such was the level to which land politics and power plays in terms of encroachment, right? It was found that about three to 4,000 acres of lake land had been encroached. And very critical watersheds these were. 